Be'ezras Hashem, with God's help, we begin today a new section of laws called Hilchois Trumois, the laws of Truma. This book is really all about the agricultural obligations that a Jew has um, on his farm when, when, when producing crop. We've learned the set of laws that applies while planting, not to make mixtures. We've learned the set of laws that applies right at the beginning of the harvest, all the gifts to the poor. And now we're continuing with the next gift that comes once you take all the harvested grain and make it into a pile almost basically ready to go. And the first gift is truma. Truma is the 2% that you give to a Kohen. A whole set of laws for two weeks just on this truma. So as the Ramam always does, he gives us the list of mitzvahs that are going to be discussed in this set of laws. It says the Ramam yesh bichlolan shmoina mitzvahs. We're going to be discussing eight mitzvahs all related to truma, to that 2% of the crop that's given to the Kohen. Shtayim mitzvahs asay, v'sheish mitzvahs leisa say there are going to be two positive, six negative mitzvahs, v'zehu pratan, and these are their details. Aleph, lahafrish truma g'dayla. Number one is that the first thing a farmer needs to do once he's ha- created a pile out of all of his grain is to separate what's called the major truma. The major truma is the 2% that's given to the Kohen. Beis, lahafrish trumas maiser. This is really a mitzvah that relates to the next set of laws. After the 2% to the Kohen, you give 10% to the Levi, but the Levi has a mitzvah to give 10% of what he gets to the Kohen. That's called Trumas Meiser. So the reason why it's included in the laws of Trumas is because it's also given to the Kohen, just not from the regular Jew, rather from the Levi. Gimel, Shalayakdim, Trumas Meiser, Zelazeh, Layafrish Al Haseder. A Jew is not supposed to give the tithes out of order. You have to give them in order. First the 2% to the Kohen, then the 10% to the Levi, and the 10% to the poor, or, or to, to, to take it to Jerusalem. Dalet shalayechal zar truma. Zar means a stranger, but in this context it means a non-Kohen. Somebody who's not a Kohen is not allowed to eat this truma, this produce separated for the Kohen. They're not allowed to eat it. Hey, shalayechal afilu toishav Kohen oishchiroi truma. Even the servant or the hired worker employed by a Kohen cannot eat Truma food. Vav shaloyechal aril truma. If you have a Kohen who didn't have a bris, he's uncircumcised, he cannot eat truma. Zayin shaloyechal kohen tamei truma. A Kohen who is ritually impure cannot eat from the truma as long as he's impure. Ches shaloyechal chalala truma. A woman who is a chalala, that means she was born from a forbidden Kohen union. A Kohen married a divorcee, they had a daughter. The daughter is called a chalala. Even though typically, a, a girl, daughter of a Kohen, growing up in her father's house, is allowed to eat truma. This chalala may not eat truma. As a matter of fact, she cannot eat any parts that are separated from the sacrifices and reserved for the Kohen. She's basically not considered part of the family for those laws. The explanation of these mitzvahs is going to be coming in the following 15 chapters. God willing. Says the Rambam Perik Rishon, chapter 1, halacha aleph. Hatruma is v'hamaisris. All of the tithes that we're going to be discussing probably for the next month and a half. The truma, which is separated for the Kohen, the Maiser, which is separated for the Levi. They only apply biblically in the land of Israel. Whether or not the temple is standing. But in Israel, that's where these laws apply biblically. When the Vim, Hiskinu, the prophets then made a takana, they made an enactment, Shayu Noyagais Afilu Be'eretz Shinar. That these mitzvahs should apply even in the land of Shinar, which is Babylon. I wonder if you can see it here. Not really. It's basically in modern-day Iraq. So more over here. This is Israel. The, out, out here to the east. Why? Because it's close to Israel. And many people from Israel used to travel there, back and forth. Bavel was since the exile after the first temple, was an area where it was basically a big Jewish stronghold. And so Jews were always present, Jews were always traveling. So the, sage, so the prophet said that they should take trumas and maestras from produce that grows even in that land. Then came the sages, the early sages, and they enacted that they should apply also in the lands immediately adjacent to Eretz Yisrael, which is Mitzrayim down here, Egypt. Amun is up here, 
to the right of Israel. Because they're literally right around Israel. And they could be confused with Israel. So the same way in Israel it applies. The sages said rabbinically, take Truma and Meister from any produce that grows in these lands as well. Now because all of these laws only apply in Israel, so we have to spend a bunch of time defining the borders of Israel. And so the first chapter of this set of laws is basically going to be dedicated in major part to defining the borders of Eretz Yisrael. It says that Amma Malach is Eretz Yisrael Ha'amura B'chal Makar. Whenever we use the word Eretz Yisrael in Halacha, the land of Israel, He Ba'aratzais, or Ha'aratzais, Shekavshan Melech Yisrael Einavi Midas Rev Yisrael. It refers to the lands that were conquered by a Jewish king or by a prophet, with the consent or with the involvement of most of the Jewish people. This is called the public conquest. When most of the Jewish people are involved in conquering a land, that's called Eretz Yisrael. But if you have an individual Jew, or a family, or even a tribe, and they went and conquered a place for themselves, even if it happens to be in the geographical space, of the land that was promised to Avram Avinu. The Ramam uses the word Shanitna as if it was already given, because in a certain way, once the land was promised to Avram, it was already given to him in a way. <laughs> Nevertheless, <laughs> So since it was only conquered by an individual, it's not called Israel in the respect that all the mitzvahs that apply to Israel should apply over there. There may be an essential holiness, the Rebbe has a whole talk on this, which we're going to probably discuss later when we get to the laws of the Beis HaBechira, of the Temple. But the point is that there was, there's like a few levels in how the holiness of Israel took place or manifested itself. As soon as the Jews conquered the first city of Yericho, there was a major Kedusha change in the whole land. Nevertheless, as long as an individual went and conquered his own place without the entirety of the Jewish people involved, the mitzvahs of Israel wouldn't apply there. When we pnezeh, for exactly this reason, Joshua and his court divided the land of Israel to all the tribes, even though at the time of the division it wasn't fully conquered. So here you have the map of Israel, taken from Wikipedia actually, and you can see an approximate division of the land of Israel to, to the tribes. When Yehoshua uh, apportioned these lands, most of the land actually wasn't conquered yet. But he still wanted to establish every portion's connection, every tribe's connection to their portion. Exactly for this reason. So that when every tribe will ultimately go and conquer its portion, it won't be considered the conquest of an individual, rather the conquest of the public of the cloud. Halacha Gimel Shekabash David In King David's time. There was a series of lands that he conquered outside of the biblical land of Israel. Three famous cities are Aram Naharayim, Aram Tsoiva, and Achlov. They're today in modern day Syria. But if you look at this map, these two maps over here are taken from the art scroll Yerushalmi to tractate Shvius. They did a tremendous job in the back of the book. Uh, covering all the different views of the borders of Israel. The topic they're concerned with is more of a different issue, but I'm just borrowing the maps to bring out the point. Here you see it says Surya up here on top of the second map. This is the area we're talking about, kind of above the biblical land of Israel. In today's modern-day Syria, David HaMelech, in addition to conquering the whole land of Israel, he also conquered lands outside of Israel. Even though he was the king of Israel and he was acting on the instructions of the high court, this area which King David conquered had a basically funny status all the time. It was never considered fully Eretz Yisrael for all matters. It was never fully considered the diaspora for all matters. Like let's say, for example, Babylon and Egypt, those were considered fully Chutz Laaretz. They left the category of being called the diaspora, but they didn't reach the full category of being called the biblical land of Israel. Why was that? Why do they have a level lower than 
the land of Israel's level. Historically speaking, King David conquered these lands before he finished conquering all of the land of Israel that he was supposed to conquer. There were still remained some of the people of the seven nations. And basically, halachically speaking, Israel is one unit. And it's not called the Jewish peoples until it's fully conquered. The Ilu Tafas Kal Eretz Kanal Nigvulaisel. The Acharkach Kavasharatz Sacherais. Had he done it in the reverse order, had he first conquered all of the Eretz Kanan according to its borders, and then went ahead and conquered those outer lands, Haya Kibushai Kulai Karitz Yisrael Echadavar. Then the entire conquest would have been treated like Israel for all matters, but because he went out of order, so it never panned out. The Haaratz Yisrael Kavash David Heina Nikroim Surya. In Halacha, those lands that David Amelach conquered are called Surya. Surya today translates as Syria. It's not exactly Syria, but it's, the, it's a big strip of land that King David conquered. And this is a map that I took out of the Rambam that I used, the Moznayim Rambam. This is the area you can... Also, it's all approximate. This is a lot, a lot of debate as to exactly where the, uh, the cities and the, the strips of land that the Rambam mentions, but basically over here. So this dotted line all around is the first conquest that was done uh, when the Jews came in uh, from, from Egypt. And King David conquered a lot of this land out here. Is Tzor and Sidon was... No, Tzor is up here. Tzor is up here, more by Lebanon. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. no. <coughs> is Tzor and Sidon part no. of the Malachan? No, it's right outside. Right outside. Right outside, yeah. So this is, called, this is called Surya. Now, why is it important to know about Surya? So the Ramam says in Allah Dalit, Surya, Yesh Dvarim Shei Bohen Ka'aretz Yisrael, because it had this semi-status of not being Israel, not being diaspora, so some halachas that apply to it apply like Israel. Other halachas apply like the diaspora. The the bottom line of it is, as it relates to us, is if you buy land, you buy real estate in Surya, definitely as it relates to the laws of separating Truma and Maiser and keeping Shemitah, the seventh sabbatical year where you don't work the land, Buying real estate in Surya is like buying real estate in Israel. The hakel besurya midivrei seifrim. But every single mitzvah which applies in Surya, know that it only applies rabbinically. Definitely doesn't apply biblically. Now, before we get to Surya, let's return to the core land of Israel. It says that Amma Malachahe, kol shehechziko ele mitzrayim beniskadesh kedusha rishayna. Whatever land of Israel was taken possession by those who came up from Egypt, it's the Jewish people when they came from the desert, and it became holy with what's called the first sanctification. Kevan Shagalu Batla Kedushasan. Once they went out of exile, after the first temple was destroyed, they were exiled to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar, that holiness was completely canceled. Shekdusha Rishayna, because the first sanctification of Israel, Lefisha Hoysa Mipnei HaKibosh Bilvad, because it was only based on conquest, Kidsha Lishayta, Veloi Kidsha Asir Lavai. It only made the land of Israel sanctified for its time, but not for the future times. The Rebbe has a whole talk where he contrasts this halacha with another halacha in the laws of the Holy Temple. And based on the Rambam's exact wording, the Rebbe explains that what, what the Rambam is saying is as follows. When the Jews came to Egypt, came to Israel the first time, they were commanded in the Torah, the words are, to conquer it. That means take possession by conquest. Mm -hmm. So if your whole possession of the land of Israel starts and ends with conquest, so if it's then conquered back from you, the holiness then reverts back to its original state. It's, it no longer exists because it became holy through conquest, if a guy conquers it back, you lose that holiness. But once the Jewish people who were exiled came back up. And look at the Ramam's precise wording. He doesn't say conquered. He says they took possession of part of the land because they didn't exactly take possession of the entire thing as it was originally. They now made Israel holy for a second time, but this time with a holiness that lasts forever, for its time and forevermore. Why? Again, says the Rebbe, if you look in the, ver in the verses, Hashem this time around, second time, told the Jewish people to settle in Israel. He did not say to conquer Israel. He said settle, which means he wanted the Jewish people to manifest through their settling that which Israel truly is at its core, an inherently Jewish land. And once you bring that out, it can never go away. Because Israel, by being promised to Avram Avinu, is irrevocably a Jewish land. 
And so the second time around, when the Jews settled it in Israel, but the second temple building with Ezra, it was holy forever. Nevertheless, there were some places that the first round of Jews, when they came from Egypt, had conquered. And the second round of Jews had not settled in. But since at least in the first time they were part of Israel, the sages left those to be included. And they never exempted them from the obligations of tithes and separations for the Kohen for the Levi. There should be more access for the poor people to, uh, to have more produce during Shemitah years. Because one of the gifts is Maestro Ani, a gift to the poor. With one exception, two exceptions. Rabbeinu HaKadosh, the author of the Mishnah, he said that Beis Sha'an, so said even today in Israel, Beit Sha'an, even though it was among those places that was not conquered the second time round, that it was conquered the first time round, he allowed or he permitted that place to no longer have to give Truma and Maestres. He also voted, together with his court, about Ashkelon, the city towards the bottom of Israel, in the south, and exempted it from the requirement to give Maestres. But other than that, let's return maybe to, maybe to the colored maps, so you can see a little more of a distinction. This area, and we're going to soon define exactly where, but most of Israel was conquered the first time round by those who came from Egypt. And this red area here is what was conquered by the Oile Bavel the second time round when the Jews came up from Babylon with Ezra. So while it extends more eastward, it doesn't extend as far up and down northward and southward. And what the Ramam is basically saying is that the north and south parts, even though they were not settled the second time round, the sages still kept them within the obligation of Truma and Meiser. Halakha Vav, the Ramam summarizes. Nimtza kol ha'olam. Bottom line is, the entirety of the world, when it, when it comes to mitzvahs related to, the, to, to Israel, are divided into three categories. Eretz Yisrael, the Surya, the Chutzal Eretz. We have Israel, Surya is the strip of land conquered by King David, and the Diaspora. The Eretz Yisrael, Nechlekes Lishnayim, and within Israel you have two categories. Kol Sheikh Ziko Ele Bavel, Chelek Echad. Whatever was settled the second time round by the early Bavel, this red area here, is one category. And whatever was originally conquered the first time only by those who came to Egypt, but not the second time round, is a second category, also obligated in Truma and Maishras, but not fully biblically. The Chutzal Aretz, Nechlekas Lishnayim, and also the diaspora is divided in two, as we said in Halacha Aleph, Eretz Mitzrayim, Bishinar Ve'Aminu Mayav, the lands that are right around Israel, Egypt and Babylon and Amun and Mayav, Hamitzvah Sneagas Ben Medivri Seifrim, and Nevi'im. Those mitzvahs apply there rabbinically and from the prophets. Ushado Haratzeis, Ein Trumis Umaiser Sneagas Ben, but every other land, United States, Vichulu, doesn't have these mitzvahs applying in them. So, once we mention that there was two times Israel was conquered, the Ramam goes for a minute and gives us the borders of Israel that was conquered in the times of the Jews that came out of Egypt, and then a little bit about uh, what the second round of Jews conquered. A lot of what the Ramam, a lot of the cities the Ramam uses are very obscure. They've been highly debated. I'm just going to show you one opinion uh, that's represented in these maps. Halacha Zayim. Eza he eretz shehechziku bo eli mitzrayim. What exactly was the land that was possessed by those who came from Egypt? So the Ramam first draws the east-west borders. The east-west borders are Meidekem, from the city called Rekem in the east of Israel, Ad Hayam Hagadol, till the Mediterranean Sea. That's easy. The western border of Israel is easy because it's, it's just right down the coast. Where is Rekem? So it's somewhere, to, somewhere in the east, over here. It doesn't go very far out because Transjordan was not conquered or was not settled as part of Israel when the Jews came up from Egypt. But basically somewhere around here. And so it goes, it's, it's, it's north of the Sea of Galilee. Yeah. And it goes to the west. In other words, the east-west borders are from here all the way to the coast. And then going south-north, so the Ramah begins at the bottom. Me Ashkelon, she le Meretz Yisrael, ad Akai she It goes from Ashkelon. Here's Ashkelon over here. If you can see it so clearly. But yeah, there it says Ashkelon. And it goes up all the way to Akko. Right here. Now, 
Hoya mehalich me akrilik ziv. When you walk, and my, and my computer is very small, so I'm looking over here. When you walk from Akri to Kaziv, you see Kaziv is the, the next city right up there. Mm -hmm. Literally the next red dot. Okay, and again, we're going with one opinion that says that Akri and Kaziv are right over here. Others place them in really even further up places or down here. But this is the Rambam's simple understanding. You're going from Akri to Kaziv. Even though it looks like, at this point, you're ascending straight along the border of Israel, nevertheless, says the Rambam, you should know that there's a small strip of land right there. And I wish I could zoom in just to show you this, but maybe this will allow for a zoom? No. Okay. The bottom line is this little strip. When you're going up, I'm about to try to draw it in the air, okay? When you're going up, the, the border doesn't go straight. It goes like this. Inwards, it's like a little U, almost. Basically, a strip of land going inwards that was not conquered. So while it seems like you should go straight up, you really, from Akka to Kziv, there's an area that goes inwards. Mm -hmm. And because there's an area that goes inwards, says the Rambam, kol ha'aretz sha'al yeminoi, all the land to your right, northward, I'm sorry, eastward, even though it looks like, based on these borders, that it's part of the land of Israel, shehu mizrach haderech, the east of the path, harei becheskas chutz ha'aretz. You should know, right there, right there on that little walk, there's a strip of land that's actually called part of the diaspora. To the point that it has a ritual state of, state of impurity. All the lands outside of Israel have ritual impurity. It's exempt from tithes, it's exempt from keeping Shemitah. Unless you know for sure that that place is part of Israel. Only the land to your left. The west of the path is included in Israel because it's not part of that you. Still part of that strip of land that's still part of Israel. It's pure. It's not part of the land of the nations. And it's obligated to give Maeser, obligated to keep Shemitah. Till you know for sure that it's part of Chutz Laretz. But that's only in that small strip of land from Akka to Kaziv. Then the border continues. Israel continues going upwards. The Jews that came out of Egypt conquered a lot of land in the north. Anything going downwards. You said umanum with Aleph? Yeah, you have Samanum, right? With a Samach? Yeah. There's a bit of an argument if it's Amanu Mountains or the Samanu Mountains. Once you get from the slopes of the Amanu Mountains going down inwards, Eretz Yisrael. That's the land of Israel. Now, I'm going to give you again only one opinion of this. The Ramam himself writes this in a response and a tshuva elsewhere that the, the mountains of Amanum are the mountains of Banias, up here. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, according to the Ramam, it would seem that the Oile Mitzrayim conquered all the way to here. There's a group of mountains over here, but they only conquered till the top of the peak of the mountain. So anything which slopes inwards from those mountains, Eretz Yisrael. Miture Umanum or Samanum Velachutz, Chutz Once you go past the slope of those mountains, that's the Diaspora. So the, the, the north-south border essentially goes all the way from Ashkelon, according to the Rambam, all the way up to here. With the exception that when you walk from Akri to Kaziv, there's a little area that's out of Israel. The Hanisim Shebayam, the islands in the sea, the land of Israel's territory extends into the water as well. The islands in the sea, Royenaisan ki'ilu chut masuach aleyem, miture umanum va'adnach mitzrayim. Or Samanum and Nachal Mitzrayim. The islands, you see them as though there's a, str a string drawn all the way from those mountains up there till the Nachal Mitzrayim. Nachal Mitzrayim is either Wadi El Arish over here. Wadi El Arish. Yeah. Yes. Or some say it's even one of the, the arms of the, of the Nile Delta all the way over here. Wadi El Arish is, according to the British um, others, is. The border between Eretz Israel and Sinai. That's why I was surprised that Aza is not in. Right. So, from this Rambam, it would seem that the southern border does extend all the way further down past Ashkelon. So basically, it would look like this. Okay? I'm just put it in black and white. These are the mountains, what you said before, all the way in Banias up there. This is Nachal Mitzrayim, Wadi El Arish. So if you draw a line, a figurative line, going from here all the way up to there, so this whole part of the Mediterranean Sea any islands that are in there are considered part of the territory of Israel. 
and has the status of Israel. Past the string into the sea is no longer called part of the territory of Israel. Were there islands? Yeah, there were islands there. Or small strips of land, I guess. Minachut v'lifnim eretz Yisrael, minachut v'lachutz chutz alaretz. From the string and inwards, Israel. From the string and outwards is the diaspora. V'zuhi tzurasa, and this is the picture that Rama many times in his uh, commentary wrote a, drew a picture. I think you even have it in, in your Rama movie. Do you have it there, or it's only in the back? Uh, no, I don't have it. no, no picture. Okay, it looks something like this. It's a very, very primitive picture. This is it over here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You really have to see it like this. This is the north. This is the this is the south, and. Again, it's very, very primitive, you know, not, not using today's maps. So in but there, the yes, there's you can see this, you can see this little engine that I was talking about before, the U by Akka and Kaziv, which is not part of Israel. Okay. Bottom line, that is a, r- a rough estimation of that which was conquered by those who came to Egypt. Where did the people that came the second time round? Babylon. Where did they conquer? Where did they take possession? So here you can see, this is, this is Kaziv. A little bit of a zoomed in border relative to this one. Here's Kaziv over here. And here's Kaziv over here. So this is Kaziv. They went inwards towards the east. You see, roughly by Kaziv, it indeed begins the eastern border of that red, that red uh, uh, shaded area. So they conquered from Kaziv to the east. They went much deeper to the east in the land of Israel, they didn't go that far north. From Kaziv and outwards, up to the Amana mountains in the north, this higher part, they didn't conquer. The Hisamonu. The Ad Hanar of Unachal Mitzrayim. And also all the way down, till the, the, uh, the river, the Wadi Al Arish, the, the river of Mitzrayim, that part they didn't conquer. So they conquered more inwards, more eastwards, but they didn't go as far north and as far south. Yes. 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 Right. So in Parshas Masse, the last portion of the book of Numbers, there's literally a whole list of Israel's borders. Right? Nevertheless, there's a lot of debate, first of all, what those points are. Second of all, how much was actually conquered. In the book of Joshua, right after the Torah, right, it's the first book, it describes what the Jews actually conquered. And they didn't conquer all of the Parshas Masay borders. So even if biblically the Torah mandated that that's the ultimate land of Israel, the Jews didn't conquer. And we have to know what they conquered re- relative to these laws. The Ramam also adds that Kaziv itself, while that, that marked the beginning of the border where they went eastward, that city itself wasn't conquered. That's why you can see it's outside of the red. See, the red only begins a little bit deeper in eastward. That's where the conquest began. The Kaziv itself was not conquered. What is the land of Surya? Surya, again, is that area which King David conquered. And again, this is the rough map up here, extending into modern-day Syria. It goes from Israel and downward. Now, downward does not mean, like, typically on a map, southward. Downward, the commentaries explain, the Talmud says, Eretz Yisrael, Gavoya Mikola Aratzais. Israel is higher than all the lands. So anything outside of Israel is going lower, so to speak. So Israel and lower, towards the area of what we know today as Aram Naharayim and Aram Tzayva, Kol Yad Pras Ad Bavel, following the Euphrates River until Babylon. Damesek, Ve'achlov, Ve'charan, Umageves, Ve'chayetze Bahen, Ad Shinar. Damascus, Achlov, Charan, Mageves, there's different cities in the area of Syria over there, all the way till Shinar, which is in the area of Iraq. Ve'tzahar Arehi Kisuria, also the city of Tzahar, is considered like Syria, this part that King David conquered. But Akko, which is over here, remained outside of Israel, like Ashkelon, which remained somewhat outside of Israel. And these are, in summation, the borders of Israel. So here you can see in the, from the Muznaim Rambam, they draw kind of a line of the first conquest versus the second conquest, much further out eastward, but not as much northward and southward. Okay, that concludes the discussion on the maps. Now we're going to be talking a little bit about some more laws that relate to these three categories of land, Israel, Surya, and outside of Israel. When a non-Jew, an idol-worshipping Gentile, buys real estate in Israel, at whatever point, let's just say it's included in the in land of Israel, 
if a piece of land is in Israel and a goy buys it, he doesn't revoke its status in relationship to mitzvahs. It stays holy. So if he has a loan, if he has to leave the fair... No, so we mean that it stays holy, not that he has to keep it, but that if it's then bought back from him, it's still holy. Yes. Lefichach, as he says right now, Lefichach, therefore, im chazar Yisrael v'lakcha minanu, if a Jew then goes and buys it back from the guy, I know. Lefichach means that insofar as Jews are concerned, the non-Jew hasn't lifted the obligations. We'll soon see there's a little bit of a contrast in other areas of, of, of the world. In Israel, when a guy buys it, yes, for the time being, it's under the ownership of a guy, but essentially it remains holy. So if a Jew buys it back, we don't consider it like an individual's conquest. The hakom in He has to separate truma, separate maiser, bring the bikurim, the first fruits, all biblically mandated. As if it was never sold to a guy ever. The contrast to this is in Surya in this area which King David conquered and isn't fully Israel. The acquisition of an idol-worshipping Gentile does have an effect in Surya to forever revoke it from an obligation of giving tithes and Shemitah as will be explained. In other words, if a guy buys a piece of real estate here, now it's done. Even if a Jew buys it back, it's no longer obligated to have Truma and Meister. That's the difference between Israel and Surya. In Israel, a guy can buy the real estate. While he owns it, there's no obligations. But the, the essential holiness is kind of burning under the burner. And so when a Jew buys it back, boom, pops back up again, you have to give Truma and Meister. But once he buys it in Surya, that obligation goes away. He has lifted it from being part of any relationship to Israel, and now it's exempt going on forever. Let's keep going with the scenario. A non-Jew buys real estate in Israel. It becomes his. During that time, it's not obligated to have Truma and Maestros taken. What about the fruits that grow there? He plants a farm, and now it's growing fruit. If the idol-worshipping Gentile was in charge, as all the work was finished, and he created the pile of grain out of the harvest, they're exempt from any gifts. Shanemar, as it says in the verse, the gancha, it has to be your grain. Your grain you have to give to the Kohen. Not the grain belonging to a Gentile. But if a Jew would buy it after it was picked, before all the tasks relating to the work of the grain was finished, the Gomran Yisrael, and the Jew finished them off, Chayabin Bakrel Min Now, because the Jew owns the fruit, they're obligated to have all the gifts separated from them biblically. Umafresh Trum Magdaila, the Nesna Lakayan. He has to separate the major Truma, 2%, give it to the Kohen. U Trumas Maiser, Umoichra Lakayan. But the Trumas Maiser, which is the 10% to the Levi, of which the 10% goes to the Kohen, the Jew can actually hold on to and sell it to the Kohen. And the 10% which should belong to the Levi, in this case, belongs to the Jew. Because the Jew will tell the Levi when it comes to the 10%, and he'll tell the Kohen when it comes to the 10% of the 10%. I'm coming after, on the basis of a man who you could never have gotten any grain from. So I'm not going to give it to you unless, you unless you buy it from me. The original 2% got to give to the Kohen. But anything after that, he can say, hey, you wouldn't have gotten it. I'm giving it to you on my own. I'm going to sell it to you. Why don't you just give at least the 10% that belongs to the Kohen from the 10% of the Levi? Why don't you just give it to him straight? Because it says by the gift, that the Levites have to give to the Kohen, the Torah begins, It only applies when you take it from the Jewish people. When you take untied produce from a Jew, you have to give 10% to the Kohen. When you take untied produce from a guy, you don't give to the Kohen straight that 10% that he, that he deserves. You can sell it to the Kohen and take the money. 
Yud Beis Machar Oivet Kechavim Aperes Shalei LeYisrael Kshem Mechubarim Makarka. So far, we've learned about fruits that were completely worked on by the guy, fruits that were bought by a Jew after they were picked. What if the Jew bought the fruits while they were still attached to the ground? So the guy owns the real estate, the Jew bought the fruits as they're attached to the ground. If they were still in their early stages of growth, they hadn't even reached what's called the time of Miser. The time of Miser, we'll see in the next set of laws what that is. It's a point in the fruit's growth at which point they become obligated to have the tithe separated. So if they didn't even reach that point, and that's when he bought them, they basically became ripe in Jewish possession, Chayavin Makol. The Jew is obligated to give all the gifts, the Nesan Atruma Yisva Amaiser Slabailim, and gives all the, peop- all the gifts to the proper owners, 2% to the Kohen, 10% to the Levi, etc. The Machran Achar Shabol Ainas Amaiseres, but if the, the Goy sold them after they reached the point of, of being obligated in Maiser, Mafrish Trumas Maiser U Maiser, you should separate the parts that should belong to the Levi, should belong to the Kohen, the Nesan Mehan Labailim Lifi Cheshbon. But you only have to give it to the owners proportionally. Meaning what? Keitza, what does that mean? Let's say you had bought the, the, the planted grain from the goy. It's already a third into its growth, but it, it finished the other two thirds in your possession. You separate the gifts, but because only two thirds of the growth happened in your possession, the nice and shnei shlishi ha maisha la levi, u shnei shlishi trumas maisha la kayan. So you only have to give them outright two thirds of what they deserve. The other third, you can sell to them and get money for it. Because that was the part that grew in the non Jew's possession. So all these halachas were when the non Jew sold what he owns to the Jew. What if it's the opposite? Yud Gimel, Yisrael, Shemachar Peres Alayv et Kechavim, Kaidim Shiavayu La Inasa Maisrais, the Gamra Naiv et Kechavim. A Jew sold his fruit to the guy before they reached the time of Maiser, and the guy finished them, they represented his possession. Pturin Minat Truma Minat Maisrais, they're exempt from all the gifts. Vim Achar Shabal La Inasa Maisrais, but if the Jew sold them after they reached the point where they're obligated in tithes, Afal Pisha Gamra Naiv et Kechavim, even though the guy finished them. In other words, they represent his possession. Chayav Bakel Medivrayim, it's the one time the non Jew is obligated to separate all the gifts rabbinically because he only bought them after they already were obligated in tithes. Vechayno Naiv et Kechavim Shagamar Perius Yisrael. Or if a Gentile finishes the produce of a Jew even after they're picked. He's the one who makes the pile. Hoyel vidigunan. Biyad David kechavim. Einan chayavim betrumo. Maestro salam edivrayim. Digunan means making them into grain. Forming the pile. Forming the pile happened in the hands of a non-Jew. So even though it's going to be liable to trumo and maestro, it's only going to be rabbinically. Halacha yudalid. Machar evet kechavim li Yisrael. Peris mechubarin. Achar shabao la'ina samaestros. The non-Jew sold to the Jewish person. Attached fruit. They were attached to the ground. After they reached the point of obligation in tithes. But the Gentile was the one who did all the work. He harvested the grain, he made the pile of grain, all under the jurisdiction of the Jew. They're not liable to have Truma and Maestres taken from them. Since they were in the possession of a non Jew when they reached the time of tithing. And the Goy was the one who made them into a grain pile. Even though they're in the jurisdiction of a Jew, they're not obligated to have Truma and Maestres taken from them. Tesvav. Hakaina Sada Bisuria. That's all in Israel. What if you buy a field in Syria, that area extending out of Israel, which King David bought? Chayav Bitrumis or Maishas Midivrayim, Kameshi is Chayav Minatayra Hakaina Bidushalayim, Kameshi Bianus, as we said, you're obligated, like as if you bought real estate in, in Jerusalem, at least rabbinically, to give true man maestras. Aval Hakaina Pedis Minevikhavim Bisuria, but if you only buy fruit, not real estate. From a Gentile in Surya, Bain Tlushin Bain Mikhubarim. So unlike in Israel, where there's a difference if they're picked or attached, or who made the pile. Here, whether they're picked or attached, even if it's before they reach the point of being obligated in tithes, even if a Jew made them into a grain pile, since you only bought the fruit, they didn't come from your land, it's all exempt from Truma and Maestres. What if you did buy real estate from a Gentile in Surya and there were fruit attached to it? If they had already reached the point of obligation in tithes while they were in the non-Jews' possession, so they're exempt. If they hadn't yet reached that point, since you bought them with the real estate, so you're obligated to separate tithes in the, in the area of Surya. What if a Jew was working as a sharecropper for a guy 
in Surya. Sure, copper means you're going to work the land, you get a percentage. Any fruit the Jew walks home with are exempt from being tithed. He gets nothing in the actual land. And as we explained, when a Gentile buys real estate in Surya, he completely lifts the obligation from being tithed ever again. Also a person who's leasing, or a contractor, he kind of takes the, the land also for a kind of a percentage. Or you rent a piece of land from a non-Jew in Surya. In all these scenarios, you're exempt from Truma and Maiser. Actually, a Jew, a non-Jew owns a piece of land in Surya. The Jew buys it from the non-Jew before the produce reaches the third of its growth. Then he sells it back to the guy after it reaches a third. If he buys it back a second time, it's now obligated to have Truma and Maiser separated. Because it reached a third of its growth, which is the obligation point, in the hand of a Jew. A Jew owned land in Surya. He brought down a sharecropper to work for him. And the sharecropper sends him fruit, presumably from the field. They're actually exempt. Because I can assume that he's bought them from the market, not from the actual field that he's working on. As long as that part is, that, that species is available in the market. Partnership between a Jew and a Gentile is obligated to give tithes. What does that mean? A Jew and a Gentile bought a field in partnership. Even if they divided a field with its standing grain. Certainly if they divided a grain pile. Every single stock that belongs to the Gentile is half belonging to him and therefore totally chulin. But it's half belonging to the Jew and therefore it's tevel, it's untithed produce. Even though the guy made them into a grain pile. And therefore, there's a somewhat of an obligation to give maiser. It's a, it's a rabbinic obligation, as we explained. When do we say that a partnership obligates them? In the land of Israel. Because the maiser given there is biblical. In biblical things, we don't say the law of retroactive clarification. That means... Even after you take the miser, you can't say, oh, that was the part that belonged to the Jew. Every part belongs half to the guy, half to the Jew, and has to be tithed. But if the Jew and the non-Jew would partner up to buy some real estate in Surya, since the whole idea of tithes is rabbinic there, even if they divided a grain pile, the portion of the Gentile is totally exempt, because we say brera. Brera means retroactive clarification. Once you divide it now, that means that to begin with, that was the part that always belonged to the Jew, and only his part is obligated in tithes. If fruits that grew in Israel left and were taken outside of Israel, they're all exempt. No need to take chala, the first part of the dough for the Kohen, no truma, no maiser. Remember, because it says, Asher ani mevi eschem shama. The law is about uh, tithes. It says, when you come to the land, that I'm going to bring you there. That means, Shoma'atem chayovin, bechutzel la'aretz paturin. You're only exempt, obligated over there. Outside of Israel, you're exempt. If they were taken to Surya, which is quasi-Israel, they're still obligated, uh, rabbinically speaking. Interestingly, if you take fruit from outside of Israel, you bring it into Israel, you have to take chala even though they didn't grow in Israel. Shanemra, because it says Shama, you're obligated there. Shama atem chayavin, bein bepeiris ha'aretz, bein bepeiris chutz la'aretz. Over there you're liable, whether it's Israeli fruit or non-Israeli fruit. Vim nikbu lemaiser b'yad Yisrael, achar shenich nesu la'aretz. And if, if the, the produce matured, it reached the point of being obligated in tithes, once it entered Israel in the hands of a Jew, chayavin b'maishas m'divreim. Not only is it liable to chala, it's also liable to have any, all the other tithes taken from them rabbinically. Can you transplant non-Israeli land? Okay, let's say you have a boat. You brought earth from outside Israel in a boat to Israel. If the boat is kind of dragging along the earth, the seabed, the riverbed, 
הרי הצמח בו חייב בתרומה ומייסר של שוויאס כצמח בארץ ישראל עצמה. Unbelievable. What the trees that grow from this earth are obligated, like it grew in Israel, in Truma and Meiser. And also Shemitah. Because it's, the, the boat was always touching the ground. You have a tree on the border. Okay, either the roots are outside Israel, it's leaning into Israel, or the roots are in Israel, leaning outside of Israel. You always follow the roots. If part of the roots were in Israel, part of the roots were outside of Israel. Even if tough rock was dividing between them, so certainly the roots grew outward into the two parts of the land. This tree is mixed. Everything which grows is half obligated, half not. If you have a flower pot that has a hole, and there's a plant in it which hasn't yet taken root, and it was also in this position. The root in Israel, the leaves leading outside of Israel. In this case, because there's no roots, even though it's placed in Israel, you follow where its leaves are. Wherever its branches extend to, that's what it's considered. Chavav, the Ramam concludes, All truma given in these times, today's day and age, even in the place where it was conquered by the Bavel, uh, pilgrim, pil- pilgrims, even in the days of Ezra originally, when they originally conquered this area, it's all not re- biblical, it's all rabbinic. The only time Truma was biblical was in the biblical land of Israel when all Jews were living there. Shanemar, because it says, Ki savayu, when you come. Now, there's no such verse that says, Ki savayu, when it comes to tithes. What we do have is, Bevoyachem, this one. Which means, Bias Kulchem, when you all come. As they were the first time they came around, and as they will be when Mashiach comes in the third inheritance. Not like they were the second time around in Ezra's times when only part of them came. Therefore, it was never obligated biblically to take Truma and Meister. So it's interesting that you know, most of the, for most of Jewish history, the obligations are all rabbinic, not biblical. The same appears to me that it applies to Meiser as well, not just Truma. They're only obligated rabbinically, like Truma. Same laws apply. As long as you're in the second uh, inheritance, it's only rabbinic.